to see you. The subcommittee will come to order. After recognizing myself and Ranking Member Deutsch for our opening statements, I will then recognize other members seeking recognition for one minute. We will then hear from our witnesses. Thank you so much for being with us today. And without objection, your prepared statements will be made a part of the record, and members may have five days to insert statements and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. The chair now recognizes herself uh, for as much time as she may consume. The one true constant in the Middle East has been the uncertainty and the instability of Lebanon since it gained its independence from France in the 1940s. Sectarian divisions and decades of mistrust among the predominant forces, Maronite Christians, Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, as well as outside actors exerting undue influence on what should be internal matters has ensured that Lebanon will remain in a constant state of uncertainty and instability. It was just seven weeks ago today that this subcommittee convened a hearing on U.S. policy toward Lebanon. I cautioned then, as I have for many years now, that U.S. policy in Lebanon must be calibrated to scale back Iran and its proxy Hezbollah's influence while spurring much-needed security, stability, and prosperity to the country. Then on November 4th, Lebanon's prime minister departed for Saudi Arabia, where he announced his resignation from office. It is probably no coincidence that this surprise announcement came on the very day that Saudi Arabia had intercepted a Houthi-fired missile outside of the international airport in Riyadh. The Saudis blamed Iran and Hezbollah directly for providing the arms and support for the Houthis that allowed them to carry out this attack, calling it an act of war on Tehran's part. It should also be noted that Iran provided the missiles for the Houthis that were fired directly at U.S. ships off the coast of Yemen as well. These events also happened to coincide with the crackdown by Saudi's crown prince on that same day, which he says is an anti-corruption campaign. Others say it's a power grab. And the tr truth may be somewhere in the middle. Hariri, a Saudi citizen himself, stated in his resignation speech that Iran and Hezbollah had undermined Lebanon's sovereignty, and he said that his life was in danger. And if anyone would know what Iran, Hezbollah, and other outside actors are capable of in Lebanon, it is Hariri. As we know, it was his father who was assassinated in 2005 in Beirut with both Hezbollah and Syria's Assad linked to that act of terror. And it is no secret that Iran and Hezbollah's influence undermined the sovereignty of Lebanon. And unfortunately, we are seeing an effort by Iran to expand this influence and its presence across the region, which has given its main rival, Saudi Arabia, justifiable reason for concern. Hariri has since returned to Lebanon this week, where he has put his plans to resign on hold, but, it has, demand, but has demanded that Hezbollah cease its interference in regional conflicts. I would take that a step further and say that Hezbollah and Iran must not be legitimized nor allowed to interfere in domestic issues as well. I still believe the U.S. must remain cautious over ties between the terror group and the Lebanese Armed Forces, the LAF, and we should not put all of our support behind the LAF until those ties are, severe, are severed completely. And while this committee has focused on Hezbollah and Iran's role in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, we haven't spent as much time focusing on Iran's latest strategic position in Yemen. The new Saudi crown prince has taken a series of drastic steps in recent weeks and has shown that he is perhaps more willing to engage Iran directly. And he is seeing, he is seeing what would be a great cause for alarm in Saudi Arabia for the Gulf and for the United States. Aside from Iran's continued support for the Houthis, there is increasing concern of a Hezbollah presence in Yemen. Imagine what that would mean for Iran's ability to interfere in internal matters of other countries and to put the entire region under threat. There is simply no way that Saudi Arabia would allow for Hezbollah to gain a presence in Yemen and then build up an arsenal of presence on the Saudi border. Perhaps this is why we are seeing rumors of a willingness for Saudi and Israel to work together. Saudi now understands what it means to be living under constant and immediate threat from Hezbollah and Iran. But these recent developments should be a cause for, the con for concern for the U.S. and our partners. 
Lebanon is already hosting 1.5 million or more Syrian refugees. Millions more would flee, likely making their way to Europe or elsewhere. It is also likely to spark yet another conflict as Iran continues its malign behavior and threatens its neighbors. So how should the United States respond? We must make it clear that Iran cannot continue its destabilizing activity, and we must continue to put pressure on it and its proxy, Hezbollah. We must make it clear that we support a stable Lebanon, free from outside interference, free from Hezbollah's damaging behavior. We must also make it clear that Iran's support for the Houthis and its buildup of Hezbollah presence in Yemen are red lines that cannot be crossed. We must also continue to support the people of Yemen and the people of Lebanon. I believe that the U.S. and international partners need to have unfettered access to help deliver humanitarian assistance in Yemen. I welcome the announcement from Saudi Arabia and the Saudi-led coalition that it is reopening ports and the international airport to allow the urgent flow of humanitarian aid to the people of Yemen. The Saudi-led coalition must play a role to allow humanitarian assistance into Yemen, but the Houthi leadership must stop preventing the shipment and distribution of life-saving aid without manipulation or diversion to those people in critical need, particularly in those residents in areas controlled by the Houthi militias. I further call on all parties to work toward a cessation of hostilities, and I urge the Houthi leadership to return to the peace process to halt any further escalation, including cross-border attacks in Saudi Arabia. We need to find a way to hold all parties accountable while working with those willing to work with us to curtail the violence and to bring stability to both Yemen and Lebanon free from outside interference. I'm now pleased to yield to my friend, the ranking member of our subcommittee, Mr. Deutsche Florida. Uh, thanks, Madam Chairman, for convening today's important and timely hearing, and thanks to our excellent panel of witnesses for being with us today. The past few weeks have been dizzying, and today's hearing offers an opportunity to help understand the implications of the changes that we have seen in the region. At the 30,000-foot view, we're clearly seeing a continuation of the ongoing power struggle in the region between uh, the Sunni Arab Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as they seek to push back against the expansionism of the Persian Shiite Republican, Republic of Iran. But the Middle East is a complex region, and simply painting everything as Iran versus Saudi Arabia is an oversimplification when there is a vast web of actors, nations, and interests at stake. <clears throat> I think it's worth reviewing a quick timeline of, of the past few months that have brought us to this moment. In May, the United States reached a $110 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia, and President Trump flew to Riyadh for his first foreign travel. Shortly after that, Saudi Arabia and its Gulf neighbors imposed a blockade on Qatar, presumably over its support for Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and ties to Iran. Then, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef was pushed out in an unusually public way in favor of Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, who will likely uh, succeed the current King Salman. Now, the new Crown Prince <clears throat> then launched an unprecedented crackdown on corruption, or a purge of political rivals, or both, in which princes, government ministers, and scores of officials were arrested, including the commander of the Saudi National Guard and Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, the international investor, uh, worth $17 billion. That same day, Lebanon's Prime Minister Saad Hariri, a close ally of Saudi Arabia, resigned from Riyadh over Iranian meddling in his country. And now, three weeks later, Hariri is actually back in Lebanon resuming his duties as Prime Minister. So the question for our witnesses is, what's going on? I know we're all eager for you to help unpack this uh, whirlwind of activity. I'd like to just touch on a few of the issues that I see as crucial to today's discussion, though. The first is stability in Lebanon. Uh, when I was younger, the capital of Lebanon, Beirut, was known as the Paris of the Middle East. Tragically, a long civil war, sectarian strife, and proxy conflicts have changed its image. Lebanon remains an important country, though, and we should work to maintain the delicate power sharing that exists between Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, and Maronite Christians, particularly at a time when Lebanon has accepted more refugees per capita than any country in the world due to the war in neighboring Syria. Sadly, Iran has taken advantage of the chaos in Lebanon to exert its influence through its proxy Shiite militia, Hezbollah. Over the past several years, Hezbollah has built up its military capacity and firmly entrenched itself in the Lebanese government. In Hariri's resignation speech, he called Hezbollah the arm of Iran that has 
and I quote, managed to impose a fait accompli on Lebanon using the force of its weapons. Hezbollah's capabilities now rival those of the National Army, the Lebanese Armed Forces. And it's worth repeating what I said in this committee last month. A legitimate Lebanese government cannot function effectively when it is in a constant power struggle to govern with a non-state actor. Hezbollah is an Iranian-backed terrorist organization responsible for attacks around the globe, and we should all be interested in marginalizing their influence. The second issue is Saudi stability. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia is vital to the Middle East as strategic partners who share common interests. But we have to be honest in assessing where those interests diverge. While the new crown prince has stated his commitment to reforms, progress on human rights has been slow, and unacceptable practices against minority groups and women remain national policy. And I'm worried that the current administration's sole focus on the strategic relationship, while ignoring other aspects, does not help provide full American leadership on issues vital to the United States, like human rights, uh, in the broader region. This administration's perceived carte blanche support for Saudi Arabia has empowered them uh, to take additional steps like the public split from Qatar. And while Qatar's behavior has no doubt been problematic and we need to push back against harboring terrorists, Al Jazeera's biased coverage, and their close ties to Iran, I am concerned that this crisis is a distraction from precisely those efforts needed to combat Iran and lead the fight against terrorism. Similarly, the war in Yemen is both a uh, distraction from larger challenges and a horrific human disaster. The war has killed more than 10,000 civilians, 20 million are in need of humanitarian support, 3 million have fled their homes, and the country is now facing the fastest growing cholera epidemic in history with nearly a million cases recorded. The third key issue is the need to push back against Iran, and while this administration continues to talk tough against Iran, I'm concerned that our policies on the ground paint a different picture, particularly in Syria where we are allowing Iran, uh, Iran's client Assad, and its proxy Hezbollah to assert greater control over the future of the country. The de-escalation zones that the administration negotiated with Russia have allowed Iran and its proxies to essentially set up permanent forward bases operating across from Israel's northern border. This should be deeply troubling to anyone interested in preventing another war between Israel and Hezbollah and safeguarding Israel's and Lebanon's future. So, Clearly a lot to discuss. I look forward to learning uh, and, and gaining the answers to all of these questions from our witnesses, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Deutsch, as always. And uh, I'm so pleased to yield to our members so they can make their opening statements, and we will start with Mr. Shabbat of Ohio. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this very important hearing uh, here this morning. We have a clearly a distinguished uh, panel. Looking forward to hearing them, especially Mr. Abrams. Unfortunately, um, I have a markup which began at the same time as this hearing started in Judiciary, and I have to chair the Small Business Committee starting at 11, but I can guarantee all the witnesses that I will read their testimony, and, uh, and thank you for giving it. I just, unfortunately, won't be here for much of it. Um, stability uh, in the Middle East is in the best interests of uh, our nation, obviously, in the world. Um, that's why today's hearing is so timely. Uh, Prime Minister Hariri's uh, pending resignation and a too powerful Hezbollah in Lebanon threatened to bring more chaos to a region that's already volatile. Uh, further, political developments in Saudi Arabia raise questions about near and long-term stability in the Middle East. Uh, and then, of course, there's Iran. Uh, President Obama and his now famous uh, uh, deal with, uh, uh, with, with Iran and infamous side deals um, have allowed Tehran to meddle uh, even more uh, throughout the Middle East. Um, this committee has, of course, paid very close attention uh, to that um, as, as Tehran seizes opportunities to increase its influence, to develop uh, its military capacity, and to strengthen its proxies, especially Hezbollah and Lebanon. Um, nothing threatens our allies in the region more than an unchecked uh, Iran. So I, uh, again, want to thank, uh, thank you, you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing, and I yield. And we thank you very much for always making the time to come uh, to our hearings in spite of um, other commitments. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. Uh, Mr. Boyle is recognized. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you as well as Ranking Member Deutsch for holding this hearing. Um, I look forward to this as an opportunity to learn, uh, specifically because the last few weeks in the kingdom have been among the most dramatic in, in decades. 
And uh, I'm of two minds in terms of what MBS is doing. One it was forwarded in the New York Times piece by Friedman, uh, I think a few days ago, which is a fairly generous view that this is a modernization, a crackdown on corruption, a returning of Saudi Arabia back to a more uh, moderate practice of, of Islam. However, that piece has also come in uh, for some criticism that that is a, a naive or overly generous view. So uh, this is really one of the most critical questions that we face, given the Saudi role in funding Wahhabism for the last several decades. If Saudi Arabia were to return to a pre-1979 um, more um, open uh, practice of, of Islam, that certainly would have a dramatic effect not only on the kingdom but on the wider region and the world. And so as we go through the witness testimony uh, today, I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts uh, about what you think uh, is behind what MBS is doing and what direction you see Saudi Arabia taking. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you very much, my friend. And now, uh, I don't know if any of our uh, Republican members would like to be. We'll go to Mr. Liu, thank you. Thank you. One of the issues I'm interested in hearing about today is Jared Kirshner's role in U.S. policy towards Saudi Arabia. I'm concerned that he has no idea what he is doing. He has no foreign policy experience and zero foreign policy credentials. I'm equally concerned he has a massive conflict of interest. Earlier this year, media reports that Jared Kirshner companies, the Kirshner companies, sought a $500 million cash infusion for the troubled 666 building in New York from the ex-Qatari Prime Minister. That didn't work out, and then Saudi Arabia blockaded Qatar. Did Jerry Kirshner give them the green light? Last month, Jerry Kirshner took an unannounced trip to Saudi Arabia. Did he ask those Saudi Arabia officials for a cash infusion for the 666 building? We need to know if Jerry Kirshner is working on behalf of the American people, or is he working for himself and his family? I yield back. Mr. Liu. Uh, Ms. Frankel of Florida. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for this hearing to you and the ranking member. I look forward to the uh, testimony here. I know there are a lot of scary things going on in the world, uh, including right here in the United States of America, where we are witnessing a depletion of State Department personnel and resources, which in the opinion of many is a threat to our own national security because we are failing to use the tools of diplomacy and development, and I am interested in your opinion on that subject. And I yield back. Thank you, my friend. Any other members wish to be recognized? Seeing no other um, signs, I would like to introduce our, our panelists. First, I'm delighted to welcome back an old friend, Mr. Elliot Abrams, Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations. Prior to holding this position, Mr. Abrams served in various roles for previous U.S. administrations, including Deputy Assistant to the President, Deputy National Security Advisor for Global Democracy Strategy, Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs, and Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. Wow. Thank you uh, for your service. We look forward to your testimony. And next, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Salem. Salem? What it, Salem is good? Okay, I don't. I don't know which one is correct, sorry, who serves as the Senior Vice President for Policy Research and Programs at the Middle East Institute. Prior to joining the Middle East Institute, Dr. Salem was the founding director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. He served in various other capacities focusing on Lebanon. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, sir. And finally, we welcome, welcome back our good friend, uh, Dr. Tamara Kaufman, Wittes, Wittes, Senior Fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. Previously, Dr. Wittes served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. She also served as a Middle East Specialist at the U.S. Institute of Peace and as Director of Programs at the Middle East Institute. We look forward to hearing your testimony. Welcome back. And we will begin with you, Mr. Abrams. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. You've got material here for about five hearings. Um, let me start with Saudi Arabia and try to answer some of the questions. 
about uh, what's going on. I think that what the Crown Prince is doing is reacting to several crises that face the kingdom. The first is economic, a very young and fast-growing population, huge decline in oil prices. The old economic model was going to collapse. The state just couldn't throw off enough revenue to support um, the population and the government. So some way had to be found, has to be found, to employ uh, all of these young people, men and women, and make the economy more productive and less oil dependent, and that's the goal of his plan, Saudi 2030. Second challenge is governance, moving from the old model where you go from one very elderly brother to another. Um, in any event, the passage of time was gonna render that generation uh, out of the picture. And the third challenge is the challenge of Iran. And as the Saudis see it, there's a nightmare here. Being sandwiched between an Iranian-controlled Iraq and an Iranian-controlled Yemen, with growing Iranian power in Lebanon, growing Iranian power in Syria, uh, and we now see some subversion in the Gulf states as well. Uh, so they've seen a decade of Iranian advances. They believe they see American reluctance to halt those advances. Um, and thus, I think, they're more assertive uh, foreign policy. So I think if you ask the crown prince, he would say he is reacting rather than uh, acting. And I think that basically, uh, we should very much hope that these plans succeed. Uh, but let me turn to Lebanon. Obviously, I'd be happy to go back to that in, uh, in the Q&A. We've seen a, in the last decade a very significant increase in the power um, of Hezbollah in Lebanon and outside Lebanon. Uh, the realm of operations now includes a lot of the Middle East, thousands of fighters in Syria, trainers to Iraq, uh, backing the rebels in Yemen. Uh, organizing a battalion of militants from Afghanistan. So now Iran has a foreign legion. Uh, in addition to the Quds Force, it has Hezbollah. Uh, and I say that in part because I have heard uh, people say the Saudis are creating a crisis in Lebanon, and I don't think that's right. I think Iran and Hezbollah have created this crisis in Lebanon and more broadly in the region. Um, and it raises some real questions for us about our uh, policy toward Lebanon. What the Saudis are asking for in Lebanon, uh, which is uh, for Hezbollah to stop acting as if it were completely independent of the state, acting on behalf of Iran, refusing to allow the state to have sovereignty within the borders, these are actually the demands of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, that ended the last war between Hezbollah and Israel. It called for the extension of control of the government of Lebanon over all Lebanese territory, full sovereignty, no weapons without the consent of the government, disarmament of all armed groups in Lebanon. That, that's 1701. So when, when that's Saudi policy, that's also American policy. That's also what the UN Security Council called for. Hezbollah is creating, I think, enormous dangers with these actions, including the increasing danger of a, another confrontation with Israel. Um, in the remaining time, I'd just like to raise the question of aid to the LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces. Because I wonder if, uh, you know, we've given them over a billion dollars, and the most recent year's amount was, I think, FY 2017, 123 million. I wonder what we're getting for that money. It seems to me we are financing a model that we know is failing, a model in which Iran is serving increasingly as the foreign lead, the Hezbollah is serving as the foreign legion of Iran. I'm not suggesting today uh, that we cut off all of that aid, but I do think it's worth asking. Uh, I believe it's the fourth or fifth largest uh, recipient of American military um, assistance um, if we're trying to strengthen Lebanon's independence, we're failing. If we're trying to limit Hezbollah's power, we're failing. If we're trying to limit the degree to which Hezbollah serves Iran, we're failing. If we're trying to strengthen the Sunni or Druze or Christian influence inside Lebanon against Hezbollah, we're failing. So should we continue with this policy of significant financial support for the LAF, uh, when it seems not at all to be working. That's why I think 
uh, this committee and others need to, to reassess those expenditures. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Abrams. Dr. Salem? Madam Chair, Ranking Member Deutsch, distinguished Punch that button. Uh, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Deutsch, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my opening statement will be mainly on Lebanon, but I'd be happy to share my views on Saudi and Iran in the discussion. Uh, Lebanon occupies a strategic position on the Eastern Mediterranean, and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Michael Ratney said in this venue last month, a stable, pluralist, prosperous Lebanon is in the U.S. national interest. Lebanon has been an effective ally on the war on ISIS and Al-Qaeda, defeating and expelling both in August. The country hosts over one million Syrian refugees. It maintains a society of pluralism, openness, and democracy in a troubled region. And the army, along with UN multinational forces, have kept the peace across the critical Lebanon-Israel border for the past 11 years. But Lebanon has also been a very contested space between a pro-Iranian, pro-Assad coalition that now includes Russia and a pro-Arab, pro-Western coalition. If allies give up on Lebanon, it will fall fully into Iran, Syria, and Russia's sway. And if tensions are pushed too high, we risk having another collapsed state in a region which already has too many. It is a long-term commitment, in my view, not one that can be won overnight, nor one that should be abandoned in frustration. Many parties and leaders in Lebanon, including Saad Hariri, have been struggling in this contest for many years. Saad's father, Rafiq, was assassinated in 2005, along with numerous others, for doing just that. But these leaders have not and will not give up, and they deserve support and encouragement for struggling to rebuild national sovereignty under very difficult conditions. Both coalitions share power in parliament and government. Iran and Syria have built a massive armed non-state actor in Hezbollah from, starting from the days when Lebanon was a failed state. But the Lebanese have also maintained an inclusive democratic nation state and with American help have built an effective national army and internal security force. Although successive governments have insisted on a policy of non-interference in regional affairs, Hezbollah has violated that principle since 2012 and become militarily engaged in Syria as well as in Iraq and in Yemen. Hezbollah's involvement in Yemen is what mainly sparked the latest crisis with Saudi Arabia, particularly its apparent assistance in delivering and helping militants launch missiles into Saudi Arabia, including the capital Riyadh. Obviously, this is completely unacceptable to Saudi Arabia, and it is fully understandable that Riyadh could not countenance that an ally of theirs would head a government that includes a party lobbing missiles on their own capital. Hariri's resignation was perhaps a necessary signal, a positive shock, as he himself put it, that the Lebanese government could not continue with business as usual. Hariri is now back in Lebanon. He has put his re resignation on hold until he receives guarantees that Hezbollah will cease its activities against, quote, friendly Arab governments. If Hezbollah ceases its involvement in Yemen, this la latest Lebanon crisis might subside. Some signs from Beirut and regional capitals indicate that that might be in the works. But the challenge of Hezbollah is a large and long-term one. It might be pulling back from limited engagements in Yemen and Iraq, we don't know yet, but its sizable presence in Syria is part of the challenge of dealing with the tens of thousands of Iranian proxies there. Making sure all proxy forces leave Syria as part of a final settlement should be a primary objective for the U.S. and other regional partners in the next phase of contest and diplomacy over Syria. In Lebanon, as you know, Hezbollah has both a political and military presence. Politically, it is a principal elected representative of the Shiite population. Militarily, it has been armed by Iran to go head to head with Israel. An attempt to fight Hezbollah internally would likely lead to a devastating and losing civil war. And another Hezbollah-Israel war would cause much harm in both countries, and Iran would be around to rearm Hezbollah immediately afterward. In the short term, the goal should be to withdraw Hezbollah from regional conflict zones, maintain peace, peace across the Lebanon-Israel border, and seek to reduce Hezbollah's influence on the Lebanese state. The long-term resolution of the challenge will depend, of challenge of Hezbollah will depend probably on wider regional developments, such as a reckoning militarily or diplomatically with Iran, or a breakthrough 
in Israeli-Palestinian or Israeli-Arab peace, an issue that Hezbollah and other armed non-state actors thrive on. I address a number of other issues in my written testimony, but I thank you for your attention. Look forward to questions. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Wittes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Deutsch, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the chance to share my views with you. ISIS is on the run militarily, and the JCPOA has for now constrained and rolled back Iran's nuclear program. And it's these gains that allow America and its partners to turn our attention to Iran's relentless effort directly and through local proxies to subvert other sovereign states in the region and gain influence over their politics. Now, for Saudi Arabia, this has long been the dominant regional security concern, and it's now motivating dramatic moves in Saudi foreign policy. Constraining and reversing this expansion of Iranian influence in the region is a worthy and important goal for the US, and it's a goal that, for the moment, unites most of America's regional partners. It's one that could bring others in the international community on board. Although our regional partners see a common threat, they have different priorities, and that means American leadership is essential to bring them together. You, building this coalition will require persistence, trust with our allies, resolution of regional conflicts, dialogue with a wide range of international partners. In other words, containing Iran will require adroit and assertive American diplomacy. Now, the swiftness and decisiveness of Saudi decision-making has surprised many and raised some alarm. Saudi tactics and tone have changed from hedging bets between dialogue and confrontation with Tehran to going all in in a face-off designed to unsettle Iran, raise its costs, and try to impose some red lines on its behavior. In certain areas, Saudi's policy has involved primarily soft power, and it's brought noticeable gains, such as the kingdom's concerted outreach to Shia politicians in Iraq. In other areas, like Yemen and now Lebanon, the approach has been more unilateral and more coercive, and I think it reveals some limits to the kingdom's leverage and its capacity to shape events. The bottom line is that Saudi Arabia is more effective in regional affairs with carrots than with sticks, and this new propensity for all-out confrontation has already complicated some US policy goals in the region. Most notably, the Saudi intervention in Yemen is now, at nearly three years old, both a military and humanitarian nightmare. It's mired the kingdom in an expensive quagmire, it's produced a horrific level of human suffering, and it has strengthened both al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula and Iran. It's time for this war to end. Every day the war goes on, the humanitarian costs mount with little real impact on the outcome which will inevitably involve intricate political compromises and power sharing amongst Yemen's rival factions. In the domestic arena, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, is now dancing on the edge of a knife. Some of his political and economic goals are very worthy. Some seem contradictory. For example, it is hard to inspire the confidence of foreign investors while casting doubt on the rule of law by arresting hundreds on vague charges with no public evidence or judicial process. My own view is that top-down reform without meaningful improvements in government accountability, transparency, and respect for human rights will not ultimately succeed in winning the support either of foreign investors or, more importantly, the kingdom's citizens. The missile attack on the Riyadh airport last month was a wake-up call but Saudi worries about the missile threat from Yemen have been growing steadily. The kingdom faces the possibility that Iran and Hezbollah could create in northern Yemen a duplicate of the challenge Israel faces in southern Lebanon, and that is an intolerable prospect for the kingdom, one they are prepared to take dramatic steps to forestall. I think it's possible that Hezbollah will agree to some concessions regarding its purported activities in Yemen in order to keep Hariri as prime minister in Lebanon but an undeclared end to unacknowledged activity in Yemen is hard to see and it's hard to enforce. So I think we should expect to see continued tussles between Saudi Arabia and Iran over Lebanese politics. It's important to note that none of our regional allies want to see Lebanon destabilized or to become a front in a regional war 
and American support for Lebanon is valuable in maintaining that stability. The U.S. should stay engaged to support democratic development there, push for parliamentary elections that are scheduled for next spring, and hope that one legacy of the Saudi pressure on Hariri is increased support for his coalition at the ballot box. Now, the United States can successfully build an international coalition to constrain and push back on Iran's destabilizing influence. Components of that effort would include diplomacy with Iraq, with Russia over Syria, pressure on Iran in the UN Security Council, intelligence cooperation with allies, and persuading European, and China, and China, European nations and China that Middle East stability is a public good that Iranian intervention degrades. But as with the effort that brought Iran to the nuclear table, ramping up this international pressure to a level that shifts Iranian behavior will require painstaking diplomatic work. The most important tool in the American policy toolbox to contain Iran and restore stability in the region is the tool that the current administration seems most committed to degrading our diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our, our panelists. Mr. Abrams, I'll start with you. You have written uh, that successfully undermining Hezbollah's grip on Lebanon <coughs> will require diplomatic and economic pressure from the United States and our allies, especially France. Uh, European nations, as we have seen, have long been reluctant to designate the totality of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. So what is it going to take for France and uh, all the members of the EU to take a harder line on Hezbollah? And what can the US do to, to push everyone in the right direction? As you know, Madam Chairman, the French have had, his, for obvious historical reasons, a special interest in Lebanon. There was a lot of cooperation between the US and the French um, at the time that the uh, Cedar Revolution rose up and that the Syrians were finally forced to, um, to leave Lebanon. So I think we could start a process of talking to the French privately about exactly what you're proposing. How do we move ahead here? They would have to bring the Europeans along, but I, I think there's a real good chance that because Europe, the Europeans recognize the special French role that this would happen, I think Ms. Frankel was right in saying that uh, we're in many ways weakening our diplomatic instruments, but I think the beginning of it is for us to adopt a policy that says, we have a goal of weakening Hezbollah. Let's go to the French with that and say, okay, what do we do in terms of military aid, in terms of economic aid, to put pressure on Lebanon now to say the current deal, where Hezbollah gets to do whatever it wants anywhere in the Middle East, is fine with us and we'll keep paying. Thank you very much. And to either Dr. Salam or, or, or Dr. Uh, Wittes, um, either one would, would like to answer in the interest of time. Saudi Arabia has accused Hezbollah of uh, playing an increasing role in Yemen by allegedly helping to train, equip, and finance the Houthis. And there are also concerns of a Hezbollah presence on the Saudi border. And in announcing his resignation, Hariri was particularly aggrieved by the presence and participation of Hezbollah and the IRGC in Yemen. So what does a Hezbollah presence in Yemen mean for Saudi Arabia? Uh, how does Hezbollah assistance to the Houthis change the current situation on the ground? And how do the US, the Saudis, and others work together to curb Iran's latest attempt to expand its presence? Thank you, sir. Uh, I think what concerns the Saudis most uh, about Hezbollah and Iran's presence uh, are the missiles that are being launched on Saudi Arabia. And as my colleague said, I think the Saudis fear that there's a reproduction of the pattern that happened in Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And I think that's probably accurate, that the Iranians have that ambition. Uh, as far as anyone knows, the Hezbollah presence in uh, Yemen is uh, is limited to advisors, technicians, maybe missile experts, and so on. Very different than the uh, uh, thousands of fighters that they have in Syria, that they've uh, rotated through Syria and fought there. So the presence is limited. The Saudis are also uh, concerned, as are many Lebanese, that uh, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, for many, many months has uh, championed the anti-Saudi cause uh, uh, publicly in all of his speeches and his media, 
Uh, and that is something that is also uh, unacceptable to the Saudis. Uh, there is obviously a, a general rejection of Iran's presence in Syria and Iraq as well, but for Saudi, Yemen is the urgent case, and I think if there were some de-escalation or some commitments, whether public or behind the scenes, that could be something that could resolve this temporary Lebanese crisis. So much. Did you want any to add anything, Dr. Wittes? Well, I'll, I'll only add that although uh, Hassan Nasrallah has denied that Hezbollah is engaged in Yemen or in supporting the Houthis, uh, the U.S. military has intercepted shipments of weapons that seem to come from Iran. Uh, and are destined for the Houthis in Yemen. And there has been uh, news reporting of Hezbollah fighters boasting about their engagement in Yemen. So uh, it's something that they formally deny, but the evidence is mounting. Thank you so much to all three of you. Now I will yield to my friend, Mr. Deutsch of Florida. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, <laughs> just to follow up, uh, Dr. Salam, on the last point about Hezbollah's presence in Lebanon, uh, what, what happens to all of the now well-trained Hezbollah fighters um, after Syria. And Mr. Abrams referred to them as Iran's foreign legion. W where do they go and how disruptive will that be? Will they return home to be disruptive there? Uh, well, Hezbollah has about 20,000 full-time fighters, about 50, 60,000 reservists. Mm -hmm. It's been rotating about, at any one time, 8,000 in the Syrian battlefield, as far as we can tell. Uh, they've lost from one to 2,000 people killed, uh, four to 5,000 at least wounded. Uh, so it's a heavy toll in terms of the fairly small community that they come from in Lebanon, but it's a very massive force. They've expanded, or they've gained a lot of capacities and you know fighting skills and so on through their engagement uh, in Syria. They still are deployed in Syria in those ratios, so there isn't any massive sort of exit from there. Their presence apparently in Iraq and Yemen, while it is there, it is not in massive numbers. Uh, this is part of an Iranian expeditionary force, which probably numbers about 150,000, if you add Hezbollah numbers, plus the popular some of the popular mobilization units in Iraq, which, which are very close or answerable to the Quds forces and General Qasem Soleimani, as well as Afghan and Pakistani and other uh, fighters that have been uh, brought to the fight, particularly in Syria. You're talking about an Iranian expeditionary force of around 150,000. Uh, indeed, I mean, they're already causing a lot of trouble in the four arenas where they are, but it is a very troubling question for countries in the region, probably countries around the world. Where will Iran deploy these people if things settle in Iraq or settle in Syria? Um, uh, Dr. Wittes, you at the end of your testimony, you said that the most important tool to contain Iran and restore stability is the same tool the President seems committed to destroying, our diplomacy. Uh, many members of this committee expressed our deep concern uh, over the exodus of more than 100 senior Foreign Service officers from the State Department since January. It was particularly startling to learn that 60 percent of our career ambassadors have left the department uh, since the president took office. When you say that we, we need our European allies, we need others to understand the Middle East stability is a public good, uh, how, how can we convince them of that when in our own public sphere, in our own government, we seem less inclined uh, to want to play any role in uh, international diplomacy? Uh I, I think that is a crucial question at the moment. Um, and, uh, and I would say as well that President Trump's approach uh, on uh, U.S. involvement in implementation of the JCPOA has also raised a lot of questions amongst those same international partners that we would need uh, to deal with the, the regional behavior of Iran. Uh, if they see the United States walking away from its JCPOA commitments, uh, they, are, they will, at the very least, question whether it's worthwhile cooperating with the U.S. on this dimension of Iranian behavior. Um, but I, I think that uh, the rhetoric uh, about America first only takes us so far. Uh, the, the widespread uh, nature of Iranian subversion 
and the variety of tools that they use are such that this is not something the United States can do alone. It's not something the United States and its regional partners can do alone. We need maximum leverage over the situation, and that means that we need those who are economically re-engaging right now with Iran to reconsider the consequences of those choices. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Abrams, you have lots of experience in government. Uh, yesterday, when the Secretary of State defended, attempted to defend the massive cuts to the State Department budget by effectively suggesting we won't need the personnel because the efforts of this administration will help to resolve so many of these crises that we face around the world. Um, and yet, here we are less than a day later, and we're talking about 150,000 uh, <clears throat> Iranian-trained militias, soldiers. We don't know where they go next. Uh, it doesn't seem like the conflicts are being resolved. Um, and how do we, uh, first of all, is there any, does that, argument make any sense to you at all? And assuming that it does not, um, how do we help everyone in the administration understand that the challenges that we face require more than, uh, more than one conversation with world leaders or one visit, but actually ongoing diplomacy? You're trying to get me in trouble here, Mr. In, indeed, I am, Mr. Abrams. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I didn't, I have to say, I, I, I think you can always, in an organization as large as the State Department, cut 5%, maybe 10%. Um, and there are efficiencies in any large organization, but the kind of cuts that we're hearing about, 30%, have had an, a, a devastating if, e impact on morale. Uh, I think that's obvious and cannot be denied if you go over and visit the State Department. I don't know what to say, except that I would think um, um, influential members of Congress, such as yourself, might uh, try to have these conversations with the Secretary of State and try to persuade him that, that there is an enormous amount of diplomatic work that needs to be done. Uh, it, it is not a one-man job. It is going to require people at the second and third and fourth and fifth level and ambassadors in the field. Um, I appreciate that. I would also suggest, Ms. Mr. Abrams, that Im important figures like yourself with the relevant history might also have an important voice in all of this, and I yield back. That would be great. I'm all for that. Mr. Donovan of New York is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, many of you spoke in your, your statements about Hezbollah and their activity. Uh, we know that it's the criminal enterprise is, is financed through a lot of drug trade. They use the proceeds of that drug trade to buy weapons in Syria. And a lot of the drugs that are being traded are sold in Europe and here in the United States. Um, anyone have an, any ideas? I mean, this is a twofold problem. One, the drug crisis. Secondly, that they're using the proceeds to buy weapons. Uh, any of you have any ideas if there's activities that the United States should be doing and, and aren't doing now that could help uh, quash this activity, both in the drug trade and the purchasing of weapons? When everyone not, looks at one another, right, I said nobody wants uh, to answer this question. I, I would just say, um, I think a lot of this drug trafficking takes place in Latin America. That is Hezbollah drug trafficking. We are, uh, I believe, doing a lot to try to stop it um, through DEA and through other parts of the U.S. government. Whether um, it's, it could be made much more effective, I don't know. But, but we would have to say that um, they are getting an enormous amount of money in the hundreds of millions of dollars from Iran. And part of the problem here is that it's likely that, you know, if we turn off one spigot, the Iranians will just open another spigot uh, just that much uh, more because they are apparently so committed to the Hezbollah model. Yeah, if I may, I mean, I'd, I'd second that view that I don't, don't have much information about, uh, you know, the drug activity and other criminal activity, but I'm aware that the U.S. and others are trying to interdict it. But I would second that view that Hezbollah effectively, essentially, is an emanation of Iranian uh, financial, military, ideological support. It's part of their sort of defense and, and security deployment uh, with a lot of support from the Assad regime in Syria. So I don't think that stopping one source will end the problem. It would, uh, it would go in other directions. But I do want to comment on the issue of, of, of diplomacy and say 
effectively that, I mean, while obviously having less diplomats uh, is a serious problem, uh, I see that the real problem is the lack of an overall strategy uh, to address uh, the problems that military and diplomatic tools could be used towards a broad strategy. Uh, to my mind, uh, and I'll just sort of mention a few things, uh, one is that the crisis that we're going through that includes an, an empowerment of Iran uh, has to do with the collapse of states and the outbreak of civil wars. That's where Iran, as well as ISIS and other sort of uh, uh, radical and terrorist groups, can, can grow and thrive. Uh, we still have four ongoing uh, collapsed state civil wars in the region. They, that ending those civil wars, each one has very different uh, uh, conditions, must be a, a very high priority for the U.S. and all regional players. We've talked about Yemen, we've talked about Syria, Iraq might be moving in the right direction, and we still have Libya lying out there. Secondly, in the approach uh, uh, towards Iran, I think a, a comprehensive strategy must have both more pushback and more diplomacy. That the point is to get to Iran to change its behavior, to change its policy. Uh, and neither are the costs being made high enough for Syria, nor is there any uh, sort of diplomatic or political offer on the table to say, if you want to, you know, want us to reduce the pressure, you have to abide by international law, do this, do that. What we seem to be having now is sort of speak loudly and carry a small stick rather than speak softly and carry a big stick. And in effect, in terms of pushback, this administration has rolled back anti-Iranian support in Syria. It's basically you know, stopped support for the Syrian opposition, uh, possibly dropping support for the Kurds, handing over Syria to a Russian-managed situation. That's not pushing back on Syria. Uh, on Iran, sorry, nor is there any visible pushback uh, in Iraq. And Lebanon alone won't do it. The big arenas need to be addressed as well. And there needs to be engagement uh, with Iran with a lot of pressure at the same time. Madam, Madam Chair, yeah, quickly, because my time is, is running out. Um, I know Saudi Arabia spoke about extracting uranium uh, recently as last month to promote or develop a nuclear power uh, system. Is there any concern that at some point this will be upgraded to weapon capacity uranium? Uh, Congressman Donovan, I, I think that the question of nuclear proliferation in, in the Middle East is one that, uh, that the U.S. government and policy experts have focused on for a long time. I, I would say that if there were a risk of nuclear weapons in Saudi Arabia, it probably would not come from that kind of ground up program. Um, Saudi would probably look to relationships with other nuclear powers, especially Pakistan, to, uh, to get something off the shelf rather than developing it indigenously. So I think we do always have to um, pay attention to nuclear programs that have the capacity to create proliferation challenges, but I, I think that in the, in the case of the kingdom, what this is really about is a, uh, a very swiftly escalating domestic energy demand and their desire to use more of their petroleum for world markets and revenue generation than for domestic consumption. But if I would uh, say, if I might, that uh, this concern about nuclear proliferation in the Middle East uh, relates directly also to the nuclear deal with Iran, that despite its faults and limitations, uh, other than the risk of what Iran will do, if the nuclear deal itself is dismantled or is no, no longer applicable, that will immediately spur countries like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, possibly Egypt and others, uh, to acquire some kind of nuclear option, whether it's off the shelf or to build it uh, themselves. So I think the, the whole nuclear deal is obviously a key component uh, of what we, we're talking about. I think it's true that under the Obama administration, the nuclear deal had some maybe unforeseen consequences. One, it gave Iran a sense of immunity that they could do things in other parts of the Middle East and the Obama administration wouldn't react. Secondly, uh, I think when they no longer had the nuclear option as deterrence, that spurred them to do more in asymmetric warfare. It sort of created a bigger problem, that they want to assure their security through other means, and it also probably gave them some sense that they have more money uh, to spend. But I think the solution is not to 
drop the nuclear deal, but to uh, engage in a wider pushback and diplomacy with Iran, which could then add some sunset issues or missile uh, clauses, as well as pushing Iran to abide by international law. I thank you, Madam Chair. My thank time you, is Mr. Expired. Donovan. Thank Good questions. Mr. Schneider of Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you again for having this hearing. Witnesses, thank you for your insight and, and, and comments today. Mr. Abrams, you noted you have enough material for five hearings. I have enough questions for at least those five hearings, and uh, so I'll try to squeeze a little bit into these five, five minutes. I wish we could touch on, I'm going to glance by these, but these are very important issues, is, you know, you, talked, you all talked about Iran's regional goals and their multifaceted strategy uh, within that region, but in particular Hezbollah and their use of Hezbollah, uh, how they're using it, particularly in Lebanon and, and Syria, but also around the region. And we've, we've talked a lot about that. I think we need to, to address that. Uh, I wish we could talk and maybe suggest for a future hearing. Uh, you've both, you all have mentioned uh, United Nations Security Council 1701, and I can't even use the word effectiveness. Um, on that, but the, the fact that uh, Hezbollah has 150,000, give or take, it doesn't matter what that margin of error is, threatening Israel, and now Hezbollah and Iran using that same strategy as you highlighted in Yemen is, is of, of, of grave concern. But what I really want to focus on in the few minutes I have is, um, Dr. Wittes, you, you used the term, what's our maximum leverage? And I think you have to think of the image of a lever. There are, there are four aspects to, to that lever. Um, there's the load. What are we trying to affect? What are we trying to move? What are our goals specifically? There's the beam, and by analogy, the beam is what resources do we bring to this with U.S. resources, but also, also our allies. The fulcrum, where do you put the fulcrum? What opportunities are us to place and, and get the leverage we need to have? And the last piece, and this may be the most concerning in the context we've talked about uh, the cuts at the State Department, is the effort. This isn't going to be one push and we're done. We're going to have to work the levers to get that maximum leverage over a period of time. And how do we do that? How do we maintain that attention? So if that is a brief introduction using two minutes, I apologize. I'll open it up to the panel and say, help. Where do we go from here? Well, if I may start, guys. Uh, Congressman Schneider, thank you. I, I think that's a, a wonderfully drawn out uh, picture for us. And I think part of the challenge that uh, we face in, uh, in getting grips on this problem is that we and our partners in the region share a sense of threat, but, we, but there are very divergent priorities amongst our partners. So for the Saudis, as we've discussed, the missile threat from Yemen and Hezbollah's role there is priority number one. For the Israelis, the threat that Hezbollah or the IRGC would be able to set up permanent bases uh, near its border uh, or to establish weapons factories that would further exacerbate the precision missile threat from Hezbollah onto Israel's civilian population. That's priority number one. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're talking about Egypt or Jordan or other American partners, you're gonna have different priorities as well. This is where American leadership comes in, is looking across the region, seeing how these pieces fit together, and saying, where, where do we begin to have the maximum effect? Now, we haven't talked a lot about Iraq or the, the slow wind down of the war in Syria so far in this hearing, but it seems to me that Iraq and Syria are the place where we actually have maximum leverage not only because we still have forces on the ground. As Paul said, forces are not a strategy. We need a strategy that combines our tools. And I think that um, one, of the, one of the most troubling signals that the current administration has sent with respect to the war on ISIS is its consistent message that it wants to get the military job done of taking territory back from ISIS, and then it wants to get out and go home. Uh, where what we need to do is stay engaged uh, in Syria in order to have leverage on a political settlement with the Russians and, and the Iranians. We need to not betray our allies who fought beside us so that our other allies stay on side. Uh, and we need to look ahead in Iraq where, yes, we've made a lot of progress. The Saudi outreach to Iraq is helpful there as well. And they have elections next year, and that matters very much. So, you know, I don't think of pushback and diplomacy as opposing uh, means. I think that diplomacy is actually a very important part of pushing back. 
Uh, and I, I think that we need to start in Syria and Iraq. Mr. Aver? I think we're all agreeing on this. To put it a different way, uh, we're never going to win at the negotiating table what we have not won on the ground in Syria. This has been the problem, I think, from the years of Secretary Kerry's negotiations in Geneva. So pushback is part of this, but to, you know, I'm struck. We're talking about Iran's rise over the last five years. We're talking about what Hezbollah has been doing over the last few years. They pay no price. And one way of thinking about this is how and where could we impose a price on Iran and its proxies? Yeah, I, I think it's a good point. There's been a, a lot of evidence of big gains for little cost for, for Iran in the area. Uh, Dr. Salem, anything you want to add? Well, no, I mean, I agree with, with my colleagues. Maybe I'll say a couple of things. I mean, um, on the what you gain from diplomacy if you haven't won on the ground, that's true, although uh, in some cases you might be imposing a cost in one arena and you're trying to get a, you know, a concession in, in something else. Uh, I think the end point that we'd like to get to, and we're not going to get to anytime soon, and is, is an Iran that abides by international law. Now, that's extremely long term. If we get more practical, I think we do have a path forward in Iraq. It's been a, it's been a rocky road, but I think the defeat of ISIS, uh, the central government, the rebuilding of much of the army, uh, uh, and the outreach by the Saudis as well creates conditions for a reasonable way forward. Iran will have influence, but it won't dominate and won't dictate. Uh, I think in Yemen and Libya, despite uh, in Yemen there is an Iranian presence, it's quite minor still, and I think uh, efforts to end the Yemeni civil war, it almost succeeded in Kuwait a few months ago. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. It's not an impossible conflict to negotiate and end to, and the Iranians don't dominate as they do in other arenas. So I think there's a way forward in Yemen, and there's certainly a way forward in Libya where Iran doesn't have a major presence. The real um, sort of Chernobyl of, of the situation is Syria. Uh, uh, that's where Hezbollah re-emerged from Lebanon to, to have a major deployment, and from there to Iraq and Yemen. And that is a, a sort of a, a meltdown that is is in a very bad place and then that is going in the right in the wrong direction particularly with US policy effectively leaning towards the Russian option and so on the fight against ISIS went very well but there doesn't seem to be uh, any long term plan so a practical approach might be to focus our efforts uh, uh, on on finding a better resolution for Syria that would involve a settlement that doesn't include Assad but is you know, that is workable, and that leads to a pathway where Iranian influence can be reduced. Thank you. I've far exceeded my time. If we had five before the questions, we're now at 10 hearings uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Schneider. And I'm uh, very proud to yield to uh, our good friend from Florida, Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairwoman. I appreciate that. Uh, my uh, line of questioning is, is certainly in the aim of historical understanding. I think Iran has done a very good job of being tactical and strategic in, in working towards long-term goals. And uh, so I'd love to hear a few responses from you on, on where historical context might lead us. Uh, how long has, has Hezbollah been operating in Lebanon? Mr. Abrams, if you want to answer, or doctor, any. <clears throat> I think the, the, um, the real turning point comes when the Syrian troops leave Lebanon, because Syria dominated Lebanon and held in check a number of domestic forces, some democratic, uh, uh, but also um, Hezbollah. Once the Syrian army was out, uh, fairly quickly, I would say, Hezbollah became the dominant military force, and they used that power to increasingly dominate the political structures of the country as well. Uh, so I would say roughly um, the first half of the, uh, of the previous decade. Sir, uh, did you? I would give you a bit more context. Uh, to go back to the 1980s, when Hezbollah first started, uh, obviously emanating from the Iranian Revolution, uh, particularly in the aftermath in Lebanon of the 82 invasion, uh, and the removal of the PLO from Lebanon. PLO used to dominate South Lebanon. Uh, and a key turning point there that is often missed is the 1983 withdrawal agreement. 
uh, which the Lebanese and Israelis under American auspices negotiated, uh, in which Israeli troops were to withdraw from Lebanon. Uh, this is something that the Syrian opposed uh, uh, extremely. Uh, you know, the Syrians opposed it effectively because they wanted any negotiations with Israel to be in tandem, Lebanon and Syria on one side and Israel on the other, so that they could get the occupied Golan back. Uh, they opposed the agreement, they scuttled the agreement, and uh, moving forward, as the PLO had been removed, they backed the uh, Iran to arm and, and grow Hezbollah in Lebanon, partly to serve Syrian interests. Syria controlled Lebanon all the way up to 2005, and I mean control, completely governed Lebanon, effectively. And for them, for Syria, Hezbollah was a main tool to pressure Israel over issues relating to the Golan. For Iran, obviously, it was A, an ideological, it was the first place they could export their Islamic revolution and show what they could do. But on national security issues, it, since they considered themselves to be at war both with Israel and the United States, they created kind of an aircraft carrier which they parked north of Israel, which is Hezbollah, as a, a, an attack force or a deterrent. Uh, so over 25 years, Syria helped Iran build this massive army at a time when there was no Lebanese say in any of it. The important turning point of 2005 is very significant. Uh, and I would say a couple of things. I agree with, uh, with Mr. Abrams that when Syria withdrew, Hezbollah stepped up and did its own dirty work itself rather than the Syrians doing the dirty work. But after 2005, uh, it's fair to say that about half of the Lebanese parties, voters, leaders, this political system was now free. Uh, now, not free not to be assassinated, but they were no longer under Syrian diktat or Hezbollah. They struggled. Uh, so, and that's what we have now. We have a, a semi-free country and a semi-occupied country uh, struggling with a, a problem that was created by Syria and Iran and which you know, regional countries in the U.S. were okay with, in a sense, uh, for until, until the shift in the Bush era in 2004 and the aftermath of the Iraq invasion changed those calculations. The word model and tool has been used by several on this panel to describe Hezbollah. Would you say that this is a model in the historical context that you just gave? Or, uh, would we say that that's something that's being layered upon Yemen? Would you say that this is a model that they're looking to play out over another 25 to 30 years? That is a long-term goal for Yemen, so they would be on now, uh, you know, multiple uh, directions of Saudi yes, Arabia? Yes, I think, I mean, it's a model that they sort of apply in Iran itself. The Revolutionary Guards is not the National Army. It's an ideological force. They, and that model succeeded, quote unquote, for them in Lebanon. They are certainly trying to reproduce it in Iraq, but the central government, I think, is trying to fight back. They are, have already, or trying to make it part of the future in Syria, although Russia might not be terribly comfortable with that. Certainly, we shouldn't be comfortable with that. And they would, the Houthis are asking effectively to be like Hezbollah. In the negotiations, the Houthis are saying, okay, we'll agree, but we need to be able to maintain our own private army. So yes, they're trying to create that model. It must not be allowed to be recreated. My time has expired. Do you mind if I ask one last question? Please go right ahead. Um, you, know, you used uh, the term an ideological force. Uh, do you see them whatsoever as a colonizing force? <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I don't know that I would say colonizing. I think that the revolutionary that the aim of the Islamic Republic has been to export revolution and to gain influence. What we've seen with Hezbollah is that it wants to exercise veto power. It doesn't want to exercise absolute control. It's certainly not colonizing in the sense that it's extracting resources and bringing them back to uh, the metropole. So I, I wouldn't say colonization is the model. I think it's really about, um, a power that understands, Iran understands that in the majority Sunni region of the Middle East, there are some natural limits uh, on its ideological reach and its political reach, but it is trying to maximize its ability to shape events by exercising vetoes where it can. But if I may, I think there is a little element of it in their sort of sectarianization uh, and looking at the region 
in sectarian terms and, and finding ways that that links to their projection of power, that in Iraq, look at Shiites, in Lebanon, look at Shiites. In Syria, with the Assad regime, they're actually trying to do you know, ethnic cleansing and rejiggering the, the sort of sectarian geography of the country to have a, have a solid core. Uh, in Yemen as well, there, I mean, the, the, the group there was, didn't consider themselves Shiites in the same way that the Iranians do, but they're being moved in that direction. And that's, that is then, uh, sort of, that's where the link to the collapse of nation states and civil war is the real problem, that once the state collapses, people revert to their sectarian or communal identities, and Iran steps in and says, okay, your state isn't working, I can help you. Uh, so that's why I emphasize ending civil wars and standing up states, even if they're rickety and imperfect and whatnot, but, but they're very significant, that that is a very important goal. Secondly, I'm extremely heartened that Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, hopefully, I mean, since 1979, as was mentioned, Saudi Arabia fell into that game. That, oh, the Iranians are backing Shiites, maybe we should back Sunnis, and, and maybe that's a good way to do it. I think the new leadership in Saudi Arabia is realizing that is bad for them, it's bad for their own societies, and it's bad for the region. It's not good domestic policy, it's not good foreign policy. And I think if MBS succeeds in some of the things that he's doing particularly, to reverse that decision that was made in 1979 to, to finance and export a pretty virulent form of sort of uh, Wahhabi Islam, I think that is being recognized. That is of historic importance for the kingdom, for the Middle East, and for the world. Uh, uh, a, in ratcheting back that, in helping reinforce nation state identities. And I would also say that what he is doing in Iran, uh, in, sorry, in Saudi Arabia in terms of pushing back against radical uh, Islam, uh, empowering women, uh, having sort of trying to build an open society is something that many Iranians want uh, and that their government is not delivering. So I think progress in Saudi Arabia might even cause some worries for the Iranians domestically, whose population wants something quite similar to that. Thank you so much, Mr. Mast. Mr. Liu of California is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, for calling this hearing on Saudi Arabia and Lebanon. And I want to thank the witnesses for your expertise in coming here today. Uh, as you know, the President has put Jared Kushner in charge of Middle East policy. So I have some questions for uh, Dr. Wittes. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. Are you aware if Jared Kushner has any foreign policy credentials? Uh, he has no formal academic credentials in that regard, although I think some of us, uh, I, yeah, no formal academic credentials, no previous professional experience. Right. When you served in the Obama administration, did the president ever put someone in charge of Middle East policy that had no foreign policy experience or foreign policy credentials? Uh, not to my recollection, no, and I think that as all of us have been describing, the intricacies of the relationships and history in this region um, are essential background for effective American diplomacy, which is why it is so valuable to have professional diplomats with that long experience in the region engaged in the policy. Thank you. Uh, now, as you know, uh, there are reports Actually, it's not even disputed by Kushner companies that they own 666 uh, building in Manhattan and that they have a $1.2 billion debt on it, which they own over half of. Kushner companies also does not dispute uh, that they have been trying to seek cash infusions. So I'm going to read you the first paragraph from this Bloomberg article earlier this year. It says, a few months before President Donald Trump encouraged Saudi Arabia and others to blockade Qatar, the real estate business owned by the family of his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, sought a substantial investment from one of the Gulf state country's wealthiest and most politically influential figures, according to a spokesman for Kushner Companies. Is it your view that the Trump administration gave Saudi Arabia the green light to impose the economic blockade on Qatar? I don't have any specific information on that, Congressman Liu, and frankly, I. In my experience, it would be surprising for uh, the kingdom to explicitly you know, ask for a green light or seek approval. Uh, I think what I would say is that President Trump's visit there, in which he made crystal clear that he's not interested in um, 
local disputes or criticism, he's interested in an uncritical embrace. That sent a strong signal that I think affected decision-making and calculations across the region. Thank you. Uh, as you know, last month, Jared Kushner took an unannounced trip to Saudi Arabia. Uh, is that unusual for a senior White House official to make an unannounced trip like that? I wouldn't say it's at all unprecedented, actually. And um, in the context of the significant reporting around preparation of a U.S. proposal on Middle East peace, it would be a reasonable step to take. So shortly after that, uh, media reports that Chief of Staff Kelly was none too happy with that trip, uh, partly because Saudi Arabia then started engaging in actions such as rounding up various folks in Saudi Arabia recalling the Prime Minister of Lebanon and so on. Again, do you have any sense of whether Jared Kushner or the Trump administration gave a green light or sent signals to Saudi Arabia to say that that was okay? I have no specific information on that. Uh, do you have any knowledge of whether Jared Kushner asked anyone in Saudi Arabia uh, for financing for the 666 building? Uh, I certainly have no information on that, no. Thank you. I'd like to now move to Yemen. Uh, as you know, in Yemen, the Saudi-led coalition has engaged in a number of airstrikes. Reporting from MC International, Human Rights Watch, and other organizations suggest that a number of these airstrikes struck civilians nowhere near military targets. Uh, when I served on active duty in the Air Force, one of my duties was to teach the law of armed conflict. These look like war crimes to me. Uh, do you have any indication whether uh, there have been less war crime-like strikes in Yemen, or has the situation remained the same? Uh, the question of Saudi targeting is not one I have followed closely. Uh, the civilian casualties from bombings have been significant. The, the greater uh, threat to civilian life in Yemen today is starvation and disease, um, which is a result of, of the conflicts um, the, the inability to end this conflict. What I would say about uh, the air campaign is that as far as I can tell, um, it's unlikely that the Saudis are going to achieve much more territorially through an aerial campaign. The targets that they are bombing today are targets that they have bombed before. Uh, and so to, to achieve more gains on the ground would require very bloody ground warfare that I don't think the Saudis or their coalition partners are interested in right now. The way to solve this conflict is at the negotiating table. It's not going to be done militarily. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. Mr. Swazi, did I do it right now? You did it right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. One of my colleagues earlier made reference to, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate all your expertise and, and your contributions to our country. The, one of our, my colleagues earlier today referenced Thomas Friedman's column in the New York Times on November 3rd uh, that talked about you know, this, this version of the Arab Spring going under the, the Saudi Arabian prince and the actions he's taking with the detainments and, and uh, women driving in their cars and everything else that's going on. What is your opinion of what's going on? And did you, did you read the article, the, the op-ed piece by Thomas Friedman? What's your opinion? Is, that, is, is, he, is he accurate? Is he, or is he being Pollyannish? Do you have as, as positive a view as he does of what's going on in Saudi Arabia? Well, I don't have as positive a view as he does of uh, that situation. I thought he missed a critical point, which is that the Arab Spring came from the bottom up. The Arab Spring was in, you know, in places like Tunisia and Egypt, the people overthrowing. In Syria also. Uh, yes, uh, rising up against a tyrant. That's not what's happening in Saudi Arabia. The, Saudi Arabia is top down. It may get su substantial popular support, but I think, I think it was Dr. Widows who said a few minutes ago, um, that's a question. This is not going to be a one or two year program. He, the Crown Prince calls it Saudi 2030. We're talking about decades here. I think they're going to need popular support, and I think that's something that, that Friedman really missed. How do they get that popular support and maintain it uh, over time? 
Uh, yeah, I wouldn't compare it as, as Mr. Abrams said, Arab Spring, you know, gets into different models of how things happened or succeeded or failed. Uh, my reading of what's happening in Saudi Arabia, it's a very, very profound change. It's a top-down attempt at revolution, social revolution, cultural revolution, and economic revolution, and in a sense, political revolution as well. Uh, I think the uh, economic side, as I think Mr. Abrams said in his opening statement, was had to be done, was way overdue. Uh, the, the numbers in the economy would not add up uh, because of oil prices and consumption and so on. Uh, so Vision 2030 was the heart of trying to sort of privatize uh, and get away from energy. I think on the issue of corruption uh, that the Crown Prince is absolutely right in having to tackle it in a major way. Uh, corruption, it would be even hard to have called it corruption. It was sort of a way of life that money sort of flows up and is shared among uh, royals in all kinds of deals. That was the way business was done. Uh, and his attempt to go from that to, to an economy where that is no longer the norm is absolutely necessary. And now how he did it and what ways can be debated. Uh, in the uh, cultural side, his stand against uh, extreme extremist or politicized Islam is, is incredibly necessary and incredibly important for Saudi Arabia and for the entire region and the world. And I think he's taken an incredibly bold position on that and extremely valuable. On the empowerment of women, it's not, well, driving, but that, that, is, that is a big move and other things as well. It's uh, that direction is, uh, is at least the right direction to be going, to be going in. Um, uh, and I think he, you know, if, it, if this succeeds, he might at the end of the day have a problem of how to empower these people he's empowered politically. We haven't, we haven't figured that out yet. But I think uh, uh, we should be hoping that a lot of what he does succeeds, that yes, it's done in a regularized way and it is not uh, that in a way that could eventually encourage also growth and investment and so on. But very historic, I think, what's going on. I'll just add two quick points. One is I don't think that revolutionary is the appropriate word to apply. This is about consolidating and sustaining the Saudi kingdom. Um, and in fact, the, the transformation that's underway is shifting the political base of the monarchy from this patronage network of royals and elites to a more populist base um, in the younger generation. This swift decision making, these bold moves are popular and the fact that the crown prince is of this generation is popular, but he's, he is doing this by centralizing power in his own hands. He's doing this by marginalizing and discrediting rival members of the royal family. And he's doing this by making a lot of promises to that young Saudi population that it's not clear he's gonna be able to deliver economically, socially, and certainly, as Mr. Abrams pointed out, politically. So this is a very risky play that is about consolidation of power. I also think, as Dr. Salem said, it's about strengthening the nation state in the face of these transnational forces in the region. Um, the second point I'd make is, is about the cultural liberalization and the empowerment of women. And I understand that the driving issue is extremely symbolic. Uh, and there are dozens of Saudi women who worked for years demanding their right to drive. But at the end of the day, um, the ability to drive a car has economic consequences. It, can, it has important personal consequences, but it is not transformational. This is a, a country with guardianship laws that allow Saudi males to treat their wives, daughters, and sisters as um, subordinate property. And until the guardianship system is tackled in this reform process, I, for one, am going to remain a bit skeptical about the reach of this liberalization. Thank you. So I've more than used up my time. I have a lot more to ask you, but I enjoyed uh, your answers and your perspective on this. I mean, I think it's a very positive development. There's just always more to be done, obviously. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Very good questions, and thank you for your answers. And now my good friend, Ms. Frankel from Th Florida. Thank Go you. get him, Tiger. Thank you. Well, yeah, you know, I, I know it'll be, that it'll be the two of us here. First of all, thank you all so much for being here. Well, we'll see. I, I don't know if Mr. Swazi is going to stay. I know. Oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. I'm Connelly. staying for your questions. That's right, Mr. Connolly. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Usually, I'm the last one here. Uh, that's due to seniority or lack their lack of. 
so thank you. You know, it's interesting because uh, we're, I know we're trying to have a very sincere intellectual discussion here this morning. And, you know, we don't always agree, but we do have serious discussions. But, you know, if, um, my chair lady and I, we're from Florida, and, you know, there's this expression, NASA, we have a problem. Guess what? DC, we have a problem. And uh, I think it's in the White House, I think. I think a lot of people agree. I mean, we have our own cabinet members reportedly calling our president. One called him allegedly a moron. One allegedly called him an idiot. I've seen uh, reports on TV by mental health experts who think that the president has a serious mental health problem. In my opinion, he's a looney tune. I don't know. I've, I've never... It's hard, it's hard to keep track. But I, I bring this, and I, I want to add one other thing, which is not uh, apt to this conversation, but what his policies are doing to the women of the world are disgraceful, and cutting off the health to the women of the world, that's going to come back, I think, in so many negative ways, but I'm going to not ruminate on that. Uh, you, one of you said today that you know, a lack of policy, a lack of strategy, a lack of personnel is part of the problem in trying to develop this Mideast uh, or try to deal with this chaos that's going on. So uh, I, have, I do have questions from this. Uh, today, I think it is, the president uh, tweeted or retweeted the most bigoted anti-Muslim uh, uh, how do I say it politely? Um, video. video, venom, I was going to call it fake video, which has been uh, apparently, sh I don't even think I should say what it is, but uh, it supposedly emanates from Great Britain, where even their uh, leaders there, one of them just said, uh, the President of the United States is promoting a fascist, racist, extremist hate group whose leaders have been arrested and convicted, and he's no ally or friend of ours. I mean, so one question is, is the President's own behavior and his bullying tweets and crazy things he says, do, do you think it has any effect at all in terms of trying to have some rational uh, policy or strategy or whatever? That's number one. Number two, now give me some hope. Is there anyone behind the scenes that's doing anything meaningful and rational that can overcome this president? And then my third question, which is a little bit off subject, but I'm really, since it's us girls and Jerry over here, <laughs> and Tom, you know, there's been a lot of chatter about this quote unquote forced uh, peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians and Jared Kushner going to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia uh, call, uh, getting the uh, 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 Palestinian leader Abbas and threatening him to accept the peace agreement. And I'm just uh, wondering if you have an opinion on any of that, whether it's real or possible. And those, so those are my questions. Who wants to give it a shot? Well, start, start with the tweets. <laughs> Congressman Frankel, maybe I'll, I'll start, if I may, with the question about the Middle East peace process. And I, and I suspect that, that my colleagues will have some things to say on that as well. But I think that it, in, um, as our partners in the region have confronted this common threat from Iran, we've seen uh, a lot of tentative um, outreach in different directions and the possibility for some new rapprochement. Uh, and so that offers hope for cooperation on Middle East peace. I would say that the, um, the agreements on Gaza to return the Palestinian Authority and particularly to return uh, PA personnel to the borders of Gaza um, is an extremely significant development if in fact it is implemented as agreed. Um, what I worry about, as I said earlier, is that our partners in the region have different priorities that pull them in different directions. And so when push comes to shove, um, I'm not sure we have the ingredients we need for a big Middle East peace deal that would enable this kind of open Arab-Israeli rapprochement. 
Um, the Egyptians, who have been crucial to brokering uh, the agreement on Gaza, are, are, as you know, struggling with a fierce insurgency in Sinai. This massive terrorist attack, uh, I think, ha will compel them to rethink what an open border from Gaza means for them. Uh, and certainly, it, it takes their attention away from this broader uh, Middle East peace effort. The Jordanians and the Palestinians have their own concerns about uh, preference, the Gulf's preferences um, with regard to Middle East peace and the future of, the, of leadership in the Palestinian Authority. And so I think that all of these tensions are coming into play before we even get to the question of Iran and Hamas and that kind of thing. So I, I just don't think that our expectations should be too high. I don't think that this package is uh, an easy thing to put together. I agree with that. <clears throat> I'm a pessimist about the chances for a comprehensive peace deal. Um, I don't appear today as an administration spokesman. I have done that many times um, in hearings that uh, the chairman has held over the years. Uh, but I would say, I think if you ask a number of governments in the region, Saudi, Emirati, Israeli, uh, Egyptian, um, they are actually happier with American foreign policy today than one, two, three years ago, the previous eight years. So I think that has to be part of the record as well. Yeah, I think I would agree with that, that they had other, you know, serious disagreements with the Obama administration, particularly, obviously, over over Iran, but over Egypt and some other things as well. Uh, I think, again, dealing with sort of governments in the region, gauging the effects of uh, this administration, I don't think it's so much the president's personality, whatever you want to describe it as, and a tweet here and a tweet there. I think there are two, you know, more structural things. One, that I think they're happy with a lot of the elements that they've seen, strong position against Iran, strength, strong position against extremist Islam, and so on. But uh, a year into the administration, I don't think they see the clarity of a, of a full, full strategy. Uh, you know, a lot of talk on Iran, but no real teeth. Uh, not clear about Russia. Is Russia a partner of the Trump administration or, or not? Uh, a few fundamentals that are, that are not clear, uh, uh, as well as an administration where it's not clear who's in charge and who do you talk to. The Secretary Tillerson doesn't seem to be on the same page with the president or his son-in-law on many issues. Um, uh, so there's, I find when I go to the region, there's a problem of personnel. Should we talk to Jared Kushner? Should we talk to, you know, Secretary of State or Secretary Man There's confusion in who's managing America's foreign policy in the Middle East, and that, that can't be good. Ma Madam Chair, if I might just, just one follow-up uh, on the question of Russia. We, we had a hearing, I think maybe a couple weeks ago, on, uh, on uh, some of the issues related to Russia, and one of the experts, I remember, I forget who it was, said, uh, make sure you just uh, said be cautious that you differentiate between um, cooperation and what was it sharing? Wait, I a, a staff question. Oh yeah, between cooperation and coordination. And basically, they said to us, you know, d don't tell them any secrets, don't give them anything that they might use against us. But that that mean, doesn't mean you shouldn't try in the right times to have some cooperation. As I, I, so I wanted to ask you this in regards to Russia. Do you see the, a role of Russia at all or, and how in this whole Middle East chaos, what, what, should, what do you think their involvement or our involvement should be with them? Given, obviously, what's going on with the interference with the elections and so forth. Well, when it comes to the Middle East, I mean, area we're talking about today, uh, I think there are two, you know, modes of thinking about this. Some think that maybe we could work with the Russians, and that'll be separate from Iran and what Iran wants to do, and try to create some space between Russia and Iran and Syria, for example. The idea that if Russia is empowered in Syria, they might remove Assad, they might build the army rather than the militias, they might help us get Iranian proxy forces out. Uh, but on the other hand, I see, the pattern that I see developing is that Russia has jumped on an, uh, an, an, oppor on an opportunity 
to ally effectively with Iran. Both of them are anti-American forces. They have different colors, different ideologies, but on that they agree, and those, you know, they agree on that in a strategic way. And Iran has secured dominance in the Levant. I mean, a lot of influence in Iraq, uh, victory in Syria, a lot of influence in Lebanon, and that is, that is a core area. And Russia has jumped into that uh, in Syria, providing air cover and support in the Security Council. So what I fear is happening is not necessarily that Russia is a problem for the US in the Middle East, because they could be partners in Middle East peace and other things, but they've chosen to enter the Middle East with this alliance with Iran. They, don't, they can't really separate from Iran. They would lose what they gained in Syria. So that's where our, our problem lies. And hence, yes, it is a really a big problem to think that we can work with Russia blindly in Syria or the Middle East. We have to be tough with them, uh, but also diplomatic, and you know, use all the levers to get a result that we want. Thank you so much, Mr. Frank, Ms. Frankel. And now I am so pleased to yield to one of my favorite members of Congress, Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Many people don't know that, weren't you part of the Senate staff yeah. of this equivalent committee? On I'm the impressed you know that. Yeah, I know and that. And remember that, thank you. And he is um, recognized for his, such time. Well, the feelings are mutual, Madam Chairman, and I wish you'd change your mind about leaving. Um, at any rate, um, I can't help but observe since Mr. Uh, Abrams uh, decided to opine about how unpopular Trump, I mean, uh, Obama is with certain countries uh, and how much more popular Trump is. Well, of course they are, because we're not pressing human rights. We're not holding them to account. Uh, we've seen uh, authoritarian regimes uh, arise in Egypt uh, and in other parts of the region, and they now know they're, no one's going to hold them to account. Um, and of course, uh, you know, our policies with the Netanyahu government in Israel remain uh, the subject of great debate and controversy about what's in U.S. interests. And uh, uh, Netanyahu, of course, would prefer Trump over Obama. We'll see. There's an old expression, be careful what you wish for. Uh, we will see how that plays out. But if I were those countries, uh, as I think, Dr. Salem, you were just indicating, I would be worried a little bit about some of the policies of the administration. Uh, ceding, frankly, Syria to Russia and, and, and letting the Russians lead the negotiations for what comes next. Um, you're worried about Iranian influence? You're worried about the role of Hezbollah? I don't think that's a positive step for Iran or for Egypt, um, and of course, uh, the administration compounds this problem by uh, what some senior diplomats have called dismantling the Foreign Service, and I think, Dr. Wittes, you talked about that in your testimony as well. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, I would ask uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record the op-ed piece by Ryan Crocker and Nicholas Burns. Without objection. I thank the chair. Um, uh, Mr. Abrams, uh, you and I go back a long way. Let me ask, an, I hope, a non-political question. How serious do you think it is that we are, as some have said, dismantling or hollowing out? And, and for the record, Secretary Tillerson takes great exception to that. But when I look at you know, some data, so uh, he proposes to cut the Foreign Service 8,000 officers by 8%. Um, he has, well, the president has proposed a budget cut at state and AID of 31%. Um, we know that the, the, one of the results of all of that this year is that the number of Americans who have applied for foreign service has declined by one third, 33%. We also know lots of people are headed for the exits who can retire. We're losing a lot of senior diplomats and a lot of collective wisdom about various and sundry regions of the world. Is this, from your point of view, uh, something that uh, is just a downsizing that will make us leaner and meaner and more effective? Or is, is this something that actually we ought to be concerned about in terms of our capability to project ourselves diplomatically, especially in this region? I think it's a great concern. I just 
take 10 seconds to say I do think there was no American human rights pressure on Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and their preference for Trump over Obama does not have to do with American human rights pressure. And in Israel, the preference is not just Netanyahu's. Obama had lost the confidence of the people of Israel, left, right, and center. I, I, so I don't think, I, I don't think, the, I would not associate myself with the, your opening remarks, but I well, would associate myself I, with I, these remarks. I, I did not assume you would, yes. um, because since I took direct issue with you, uh, and I, I don't think that's but, true that uh, we never talked about human rights with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I take your point, though. Perhaps what they really objected to was uh, the agreement with Iran, and, and um, Mostly. I, I happen to think Obama's been proved right in that regard, not wrong, but... On, on the State Department, I think if, of course, Secretary Tillerson objects if you, you know, say to him, you're destroying the Foreign Service, you're deliberately undermining the ability to conduct diplomacy, but I think top-down is the wrong way to look at it. It should be looked at, in a sense, from the point of view of the Department of the Foreign Service, of the morale of the building, because the morale of the building uh, can be judged not by the intention of, of those on the top, but rather what's actually happening. And yeah. we, you've uh, described, I think, what's actually happening. I've uh, played uh, the game almost of saying with a number of friends, okay, who would you choose for ambassador here or ambassador there or assistant secretary for this or that? Very often the answer is, well, so-and-so, but she's gone. So-and-so, but he just retired. So you're getting a depletion of the top ranks, and we are not starting to refill at the bottom because of these decisions not to have entering classes. Sure, the impact of that next year is not great, but we need to plan for the future. We, we need an absolutely first-rate global power foreign ministry 10 years from now and 25 years from now when those entering classes are going to be assuming positions responsibility. So I think it's, um, it is happening if you ask people in the Foreign Service, and I think it's very unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, if the chair would allow, I, I, Dr. Wittes, you look like you were chomping at the bit to comment as well. <laughs> and I know, I know you actually said the most important tool in American policy toolbox to contain Iran and restore stability in a disordered region is the tool the Trump administration seems most committed to destroying our diplomacy. You want to elaborate? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, first, I'll associate myself with, uh, with Elliot's comments uh, in that regard entirely, and I'll note that I think it's now more than half of our posts, our embassies in the Middle East, do not have uh, a permanent ambassador in place. Um, it is, including Saudi Arabia, by the way, uh, and although we have a very able team and very able charges and, and deputies in those places, it's impossible to substitute uh, for somebody who is given the charge by the president of being his representative. Uh, and so in addition to the long-term institutional damage to, uh, to our foreign ministry that, that Elliot was describing, I think we have to look at the near-term problem of empty chairs and nobody on the other end of the phone. Uh, and, uh, and so it is almost impossible to imagine, even if the White House could construct a comprehensive strategy uh, to contain Iran and push back this influence that we would be able to implement on that strategy effectively given the range and, and breadth of vacancies that we see. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that all those empty chairs and phones not answered creates a vacuum that our adversaries know how to fill. Uh, the Iranians are quite aggressive, the Chinese are quite aggressive, the Russians we know are quite aggressive. And it, it, this is just the wrong time to have a whole bunch of empty chairs and phones not answered. But I thank you all for being here. I wish we had a little more time. Madam Chair, thank you so much for having the hearing. And Ms. Frankel, thank you, thank you for letting a guy <laughs> ask some questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Connolly. Thank you to our excellent witnesses, and thank you for the audience as well for being with us and members of the press. And with that, the subcommittee is adjourned as we fly out.